words from Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her, and he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this would be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give, him, give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this truth. We thank you, God, that you are the wonderful way maker who made a way in the desert, who said nothing is impossible with me. We thank you for the example of Mary, her part in the cast of Christmas, her example of obedience and trust. And God, I pray that we can trust you this morning. We've heard the angel's proclamation that unto us is born a child. Lord, let it be unto us. If there's somebody here that does not have a relationship with you, let this be the year that that scripture is true for them. Unto us is born a child. God, we give you this teaching time. We ask, Father, that you would take your holy word and uh, make it come alive in our lives and in these people. I, I'm a poor communicator of your word, and yet, Father, your word is eternal, and we thank you for its truth. Speak to us now in the name of Jesus. We ask these things, and all God's people said, amen. So, I am really looking forward to Christmas Eve. We're going to have a great service here. Usually our family goes to the service together and then we go out to eat together. And I'm looking forward to this year in particular because for the first time our brand new daughter-in-law, Kayla, uh, that I sent away with my son to Jamaica yesterday, will be with us for Christmas Eve. And when we get back home, we will watch my favorite Christmas movie. I don't care what the rest of them say because my favorite Christmas movie is It's a Wonderful Life. Anybody else? Okay, thank you, Joe. All right. If you've never seen It's a Wonderful Life, first off, what's wrong with you? Just go home, watch it today instead of football. Let this be the year that you see It's a Wonderful Life. And if you haven't seen it, I'll give you just a very quick recap. It's a Wonderful Life tells the story of George Bailey, a good-hearted man who comes to the point of discouragement because his life hasn't turned out the way he wanted it to. And as the movie opens, it appears that two galaxies are talking with one another about George Bailey's life. Yes, tonight's his crucial night, says one galaxy, when, which you realize must actually be God because he's got a deeper voice than the other galaxy. That night when he seriously considers throwing away God's greatest gift, his life, we need to send someone down there. Whose turn is it? And at this, the second smaller galaxy says, well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. It's Clarence's turn. But are you sure you want to send him? He hasn't even earned his wings yet. So it turns out that Clarence is George Bailey's guardian angel. 
And if he can keep George from committing suicide, he will earn his wings. And so the rest of the movie is about Clarence learning about George's life. And then in the last 20 minutes or so, Clarence comes to earth and shows George what the world would have been like if George had never been born. And when George sees the impact he's made on the world, he calls out to Clarence, he repents, he runs through Bedford Falls yelling, Merry Christmas, you beautiful building and loan. And then the bell rings, and then Clarence gets his wings, and then the credits roll, and it's a wonderful movie. There's so many things that I love about It's a Wonderful Life. However, it's bad theology. As many things as I love about It's a Wonderful Life, what it says about angels is not one of them. Because I'm afraid that it reflects a lot of misconceptions about angels, a lot of things that are part of pop culture but are not part of God's Word. And we have to be able to separate the two. So I want to talk with you just a little bit about what we might think is true about angels, but what is actually not in God's word about angels. First off, we don't become angels. In the movie, Clarence talks about the clothes that he was buried in and what his favorite drink was when he was alive. And you realize that even though he's an angel now, he was a human once. And so does the Bible teach that people become angels when they die? Actually, it does not. The closest the Bible comes to this is in Luke 20, verse 36, when Jesus teaches that the sons of this age, that is humans, are equal to angels, which means they're going to live forever. But that doesn't mean they become angels. So we don't become angels when we die. And in a minute, you'll see why we wouldn't even want to in the first place. But number two, we don't command angels. Throughout the movie, George orders Clarence around. Take me here. Show me this person. Clarence, show me Mary. I mean, he's, he's just always bossing Clarence around. And the Bible does say that angels are under someone's command. But it's not us. Scripture says that in Psalm 91, verse 11, that God will command his angels concerning us. So it's not wrong to beg God for his heavenly protection. But we don't command angels. We don't summon them to do our bidding. Throughout the Bible, there's not a single case of anyone ever calling upon an angel and then having the angel show up. Angels manifest themselves unsought. Our role is to talk to God. Our role is to pray to God, who is himself the commander of all angelic forces. We don't command angels. Number three, and this is so important, we don't pray to angels. There's no examples in Scripture of anyone, anyone praying to an angel or asking angels for help. God is able to answer prayer. But in 1 Timothy 2.5, it says there is one mediator. There is one God and there's one mediator between God and men. A mediator is someone who stands between. A mediator is somebody who listens to our prayers. And it says there's one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. You see, if we were to pray to angels it would implicitly give them a status equal to God. God's word is clear. He doesn't share his glory with anyone else. So we don't pray to angels. Number four, we don't worship angels. In Colossians, worship of angels was one of the false doctrines that was being taught that Paul explicitly warned against. And in the book of Revelation, which we just spent a year studying together, you get towards the end of Revelation, and John, the apostle, the writer of the book, he wants to fall down at the feet of the angel who's been showing him all these things. And in Revelation 19.10, the angel says, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. So we don't worship angels but angels are important throughout scripture 
And they are especially important in the Christmas story, which is why we're talking about them this morning. So let's talk about what we know from Scripture about angels. And the first thing that you need to know about angels is that there are many angels Many, many angels. Deuteronomy 33, verse 2, on Mount Sinai, God came from the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire in his right hand. In Psalm 68, verse 17, it says, The chariots of God are tens of thousands and thousands upon thousands. Hebrews 12, 22, When we come to worship, we come into the presence of innumerable angels. Getting back to to the book of Revelation, John says in Revelation 5 verse 11, I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. That word myriads in the Greek, it's actually a word that means a number that doesn't exist. A number that is so high it doesn't, you can't even count to it. It's like the English word bazillion, okay? There's bazillions of angels. There's 11 billion angels. I mean, think of a really big number that doesn't even exist. It's so big. That's what myriads are. So there are many angels. Every biblical reference to the total number of angels suggests that they are beyond counting. So number two, not only are there many angels, but angels are messengers. Okay? That's the part they play in the Christmas story. The word angel is the Greek word angelios, which means messenger, okay? Whenever you see the word gospel in the Bible, it's the Greek word euangelios. Eu is the prefix that means good, and so good message, that's the gospel. That's where we get our word evangelism. So you see angel in the word evangelism, and that's why, because an angel is a messenger. So that's the role that, Chris, that angels play in the Christmas story. As we see, as we're going to see in a couple of minutes, every time an angel shows up in the Christmas story, it is so they can deliver a message. So angels are messengers. Number three, angels are ministers. Hebrews 1 verse 14 makes it very clear when it says, are not all angels ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. Who do angels serve? The ones who are to inherit salvation. Who are the ones who inherit salvation? That's us. Why is it a good thing that we don't become angels when we die? Because that would be a demotion. Angels in heaven serve those who are saved, which is us. So... Maybe there will come a day when we get to say to an angel, hey, go get me a hamburger and a Coke, because they serve us. But that's why it's so important that we understand we don't become angels. That would be a demotion. Angels ministered to Jesus after he was tempted in the wilderness, according to Mark Mark chapter 1, verse 13. And again, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke 22, verse 4, it says an angel came and, and... attended to him. So angels are ministering spirits sent by God. They can provide comfort. They can, they're going to do whatever God tells them to do so they can minister to our needs. But again, it is at God's command, not our command. Fourth, angels are military. And that's an awkward word, but I needed another M because I'm a preacher. Angels are military. Now get this. If your idea of angels is these cute little fat naked babies with little stubby wings going like this everywhere. That's not what the Bible says angels are like. When angels are mentioned in Scripture, it's very often in militaristic terms. And every time they show up, by the way, people are scared. You're not going to be scared of one little fat naked baby, right? So in the Christmas story, it says a multitude of the heavenly hosts appears to shepherds. A host is an army. In the message translation, whenever Eugene Peterson came across the phrase, Lord of hosts, he translated it, God of angel armies. So just as different members of the military have different ranks, there's different roles and ranks of angels. There's at least three different types of angels mentioned in Scripture. There are cherubim, 
uh, which guarded the entrance to the Garden of Eden. You see them in Genesis chapter 3. They're also mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 10. There's seraphim, which are only mentioned in Isaiah 6. When Isaiah has his vision of the throne room, there are seraphim, one on either side of the throne with six wings. With two, they cover their eyes. With two, they cover their feet. And with two, they fly. And they never stop calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So there's seraphim. There's also living creatures mentioned in Revelation 4, mentioned in Ezekiel that are angelic beings. So there's different types of angels. Angels exist in a hierarchy. They appear to have a rank and an order. In Jude 9, Michael is referred to as the archangel, a title that indicates rule and authority over other angels. He's called one of the chief princes in Daniel 10. He appears to lead God's angelic army in Revelation 12, where it says, War arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, and they were defeated. So notice there's not only the army of good angels that numbers hundreds and millions and myriads and myriads, but there's also bad angels. That, that fell away, Revelation suggests that about a third of the total number of angels fell and followed Lucifer when Lucifer fell from heaven. So that's, Paul says that the Lord will return from heaven with his archangel's call, 1 Thessalonians. So Michael gets to blow the trumpet, right? So I think it's important to remember this, this military organization again, and you guys that are in the military, you get this, right? Who commands an army? The commanding officer, right? So if a, a, a convoy just happens to be going by your house with all their Humvees and everything else, you don't walk out into the middle of the street and flag down a Humvee full of soldiers and say, I'm so glad you're here. My sink is clogged. Can you come help me? You don't do that. Why? Because they are not yours to command. If the commanding officer happened to say, yeah, we'll help you out, Patsy, men fall out, then your sink is going to get unclogged, guaranteed, 100%. But you don't do the commanding. The commanding officer does. And that's why it's helpful for us to understand that angels are very military in nature. When I was studying for this sermon... I found just a whole lot of garbage on the internet about how you can summon your guardian angel. One site which looks and sounds deceptively Christian, I'm not even going to tell you what the name of the site is because I don't want you deceived. But here's this site, it says, The Spirit assigned you guardian angels. We all have more than one before you are even born. Unlike archangels and helper angels, guardian angels are yours exclusively. Think of your guardian angels like private detectives, but they only have one case, you. There's not a lick of scripture on that, entire, on that entire website. There's no verses. There's nothing cited. By the way, there's nothing in scripture that specifically talks about guardian angels. Okay? And so don't be deceived. Angels have a commanding officer, and it's not you. One other thing I want to warn you about, there's a lot of online about learning the name of your guardian angel and knowing the powers of different angels according to their names. You need to understand there's only two angels named in all of Scripture, Michael and Gabriel. We'll talk about Gabriel in a minute. So if you're browsing online and you come across instructions for how to summon your guardian angel... And identifying different guardian angels by name and what the powers associated with them are. Friends, I want to tell you, I think that's demonic. It'll talk about Uriel and Raphael and Moroni and Metatron, which sounds like a transformer, but there's apparently an angel called Metatron. That doesn't come from the Bible. In fact, think about this. There's twice as many demons given proper names in the Bible as there are angels. That should tell you something about what you are messing with when you go to a website that says you can summon a certain guardian angel by name and here's how to do it. Just stay away, okay? Just stay away. 
let's not mess with that. Let's talk about angels in the Christmas story. And you see on your listening guide, there are angels that appeared to different uh, people in the, in the, the Christmas story. And I want to talk about who they appeared to and what they said all in, in one slide here. So the first appearance of an angel in the Christmas story was Gabriel to Zechariah. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, in Luke chapter 1, verses 11 through 19. We talked about this briefly last week, the birth of John the Baptist to Elizabeth and Zechariah. It was the angel Gabriel who first announced the birth to Zechariah while Zechariah was performing his priestly duties. God's word says, There appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will call his name John. I want you to notice something here that you're going to see from angels almost every time they make an appearance, and that is that they always say, Don't be afraid. So turn to the person next to you and say, Don't be afraid. That's the first message of Christmas. Don't be afraid. Why do you think they would say that? Because angels are fearsome beings. When God has something to say to us, it is serious business. But look at the rest of the statement. Don't be afraid because your prayer has been heard. The commander of angel armies, the 10 billion star general that commands all of the armies of the host of heaven, hears your prayers. Friends, that is stunning. It is amazing that the God who breathed stars into space and spoke worlds into existence hears our prayers. So don't be afraid. Second appearance was Gabriel to Mary, Luke 1, 26 through 38. This was the passage that we read at the beginning of the service. And again, notice that it's Gabriel. Now, that is a big, big deal, and I'm not going to have time to get into it. I've got a lot more notes that will just wind up in the bonus features on the DVD or whatever. But here's why Gabriel is such a big deal. Because way back in Daniel chapter 9, the angel Gabriel is the one who announces to Daniel the events that are going to take place in the future. God's people have been in exile at this point for uh, close to 70 years. And the angel Gabriel says that about 70 weeks of years from now, which is roughly 490 years, if you think of a week of years being seven years, Gabriel tells Daniel there's going to be 70 weeks and then the anointed one will appear. Now you do the math. And you look at the timeline and you realize, okay, 586 was when Jerusalem was destroyed, when the Babylonians came in. 516 was when uh, King Darius first gave the order to Ezra, you've got permission, to, or to Zerubbabel, you've got permission to go back and rebuild the temple. Shortly after that, about 434 was when, uh, when uh, Nehemiah was given clearance to rebuild Jerusalem. So doing the math, 470 times 7, 490, 483 years later after that was about when Jesus was 34 years old. Scripture says Jesus began his public ministry at age 30. So the point where Daniel chapter 9, Gabriel says, the, Messiah, the anointed one will be thrown down on the timeline is pretty much exactly when Jesus was crucified for our sins. And I tell you that because if you are not a Christian, if you think that Christianity is just a bunch of made-up fairy stories, you got to realize God planned this hundreds of years before Jesus was born. You can trust Scripture. It's not some made-up story. God told us from the almost to the exact year when the Messiah would be thrown down, and it's all there hundreds of years before Jesus was even born in Daniel chapter 9, and Gabriel was the one that told him. So that's why Gabriel is a big deal. But let's look at what Gabriel said to Mary. 
Just like Zechariah, Gabriel says, don't be afraid. Just like Zechariah, Mary was greatly troubled. But look at the first thing that Gabriel says. He says, the Lord is with you. Can you ponder for a minute what a meaningful statement that is? God is with you, no matter what. God is with you when you're afraid. God is with you when you're lonely. God is with you when you're grieving. God is with you when you watch your son drive away with his brand new wife and you're thinking how much your life has changed. God is with you when your finances are upside down. God is with you when you're on your verge of losing your house. The message of Christmas is that God himself has joined to us. One of the revealed names of Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. Turn to the person next to you and say, the Lord is with you. No, you got to say it like you mean it. Say, the Lord is with you. There you go. See, you're being an evangelist. You're being an angel. You've got a message for the person next to you. That's part of the Christmas story. Why is the Lord with us? Because he favors us. Gabriel emphasizes this twice to Mary in verse 28. Greetings, O favored one. The reassurance of verse 30, you have found favor with God. The word for favor is charis. It's the same word Paul uses for grace. When he says, by grace we are saved, grace is undeserved favor. Please understand this. Please understand this because it's so important to the gospel. God doesn't find grace in us and then come to us. We hear our Catholic friends say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. And that makes it sound like God came to her because he found grace in her. No, that's backwards. God came to her and bestowed grace onto her. That's why she was full of grace. What we should say is that when the Lord is with us, he gives us grace. Number three, since we're in Luke, let's stay there and see what the angels say to the shepherds. And then we'll come back to Joseph to wrap up. In Luke chapter 2, a group of shepherds are watching over their flock by night. These are familiar verses. Verse 9, and an angel of the Lord, he's not named here, but most scholars assume that it's probably Gabriel again. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And no surprise, they were filled with great fear. Again, no surprise that the first thing the angel says is, do not be afraid. But he goes on to say that he's bringing good news of great joy to all people. Angel, angelios, messenger, good news, evangelizomai, evangelism, good message. See, the most important thing about angels at Christmas isn't who they are, it's what they say. That's what the messenger does. So here's what the angel says to the shepherds. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior who is Christ the Lord, turn to your neighbor and say, a Savior is born. Friends, this is why Hebrews emphasizes that Christ is superior to angels. And why, if we get more excited about angels at Christmas than we do the baby in the manger, we miss the point. Angels cannot save us. Jesus can. Jesus does. Jesus can has. God didn't send us an angel to save us. God sent angels to tell us about the one who saves us, about the Savior he sent. And it's such good news that after this, Gabriel gets a backup band. In verse 13, he's joined by a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Look at your neighbor and say, on earth, peace. Be an evangelist on earth, peace. How many of you long for peace on earth? How many of you long for peace in Washington, D.C. right now? How many of you long for peace under your own roof? How many of you long for peace in your own heart? Jesus came to bring peace on earth the proclamation of christmas is that there is peace on earth with those among those with whom he is pleased but that peace is only possible through christ our lord 
If you're looking for any other Savior, you're not going to find peace. It is only available through Jesus. Finally, let's talk about Joseph. It's interesting that in Luke's gospel, Luke focuses on Mary, but in Matthew's gospel, Mary doesn't even get a speaking part. In Matthew's gospel, the focus is on Joseph. And when Joseph found out Mary was pregnant, you saw this hinted at in the video we started the service with. At first, he was going to divorce her quietly until an unnamed angel appeared to him in a dream. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, the angel said, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So Joseph does what the angel says. He takes his wife, and then he takes the child. In Matthew 2, the angel comes back to Joseph and warns him. Look at verse 13. When they departed, that's the Magi, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then once more, in verses 19 and 20. When Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought to take the child's life are dead. You notice a familiar repeating pattern? In all three appearances, the angel tells Joseph to take action. Take Mary. Take the child. Take the child. Most important message of Christmas. Turn to your neighbor and say, take the child. Take the child. The gospel requires action. For us to experience freedom from fear, for us to experience the presence of God, for us to experience the salvation from our sin, we have to take the child. We can't just leave him in the manger and say, oh, that's nice, we'll see you next year, Jesus. Take the child. It's the only way to experience the peace that God desires you to have during this Christmas season. Take the child. Let Jesus make a difference in your life, not just during the Advent season, but all throughout the year. Take the child. Experience the peace that is only found through a relationship with Jesus. Take the child, experience the forgiveness for sins, experience the freedom from guilt. Take the child and experience life eternal with him. With that, the most important part of the Christmas message, take the child. Would you pray with me? Father God, in the quiet of this moment, I pray that you would speak to these, my friends. I pray, Lord, that if there is someone here who has not started a relationship with you that this season for the first time they would take the child and trust you for the forgiveness of their sins and the salvation of their souls god allow no sleep to their eyes or slumber to their eyelids until they do business with you